Bethany Olson has questions and opinions. She reads books. She's a doula. She's into podcasts. She's into Jesus. She might have back pain, and she's one of my favorite parts of Weird Christian Twitter. Bethany joins us after this. I'm Bridge the Plot, and you're listening to The Wax Museum. Conversations that need to be had. Hello, Bethany. Welcome to the Wax Museum. Thank you, John. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Doing well. Can't complain. You you dealing well with this whole COVID thing? You know, yeah, I think so. Some days are better than others, but yeah. uh, you know, we're we're a small little family. My, yeah. you know, we've been able to uh, to handle it pretty well. Um, kids are getting stir crazy, but you know, my yeah. my biggest, you know, just biggest gratitude is my husband hasn't had to go into work he's been able to make himself mm. like a little office in the attic you know so he's, oh uh, really that's home. great yeah so he's been home so we've been like thank goodness as little exposure as possible yeah well that's the thing right like it, it's stressful like I know for me it's like my wife teaches and they are insistent that she come into the yeah. school even though the kids aren't in the classroom really yeah and so oh, it's wow. like, that's really a bummer. But like, for me, it's like, I can work from home unless I'm at a work site. And then like, so I'll have like work sites that I visit periodically to just basically do some testing for health hazards. Gotcha. And so, okay. yeah, I don't have, I don't have an out of town booked yet, but I, it probably ends up being like 50% of the time or so. Yeah. Okay. So, so eventually I'll be traveling a lot and I'll be podcasting whenever I'm home. Oh, <laughs> so. okay. Um, all right. So we've had lots of conversations on Twitter. Um, and now we're actually talking. So I was like, I, I this is going to be fun. I don't, I don't a hundred percent know where this is going. Um, but, um, tell me about yourself, Bethany. Um, where did you grow up? Uh, grew up in Staten Island, uh, New York, small, you know, one of the five boroughs, some, some areas are kind of like New Jersey light. Some of it's still mm. kind of city you know it's got a good mixture it's small but it's a lot of people um mm. but you can pretty much find a little area that will suit you know any any preference for a neighborhood do you go to the city a lot Pr uh prior i say probably a lot you know prior to uh the, the year of covid um mm. we were actually in the city like two days before everything shut down and uh you know, at that point, it was like, do I have to throw this out? And they have these weird garbage cans you have to open now, you know, to like keep trash in. And it was like, just let me throw it in. But, um, you know, I, most of the time, I'd say we go in a couple of times a year, try to see a show, you know, anniversary and stuff like that. So you still live near New York? Yeah, we're still, you know, just a, a short drive. You oh. get up high enough, you can see it. I'd love to see New York someday. It's um, really cool. Yeah, it's like, one of the most famous cities in the world. So that's, that's right. really cool. Um, and you were homeschooled. That's right. Um, pretty much K through 12. Um, I think I did like oh, wow. one year in private school. So was it a big adjustment, like getting out of um, homeschooling? I guess, did you work after that? Or did you go to further school? Um, I mostly worked. I ended up, uh, you know, just doing kind of part time, kind of just little stuff here and there. And then as I started to kind of get older and be like, man, I, I got to do something kind of, this is about to offend like all the feminists, but I was like, I got to really do something until I can kind of like get married, start a family and like really get into that groove and I hmm. still work. But um, so I started doing some like distance education and just hmm. some BS thing. Like I'm studying New Testament, religious, whatever, you know, just to take up some time uh, while I waited for my husband to propose pretty much. <laughs> wow. Oh, this is I'll funny. be open about that. <laughs> I always like it, it. I think it's something, you know, like as a, as a, as a male, I, I never think about like the expectations that are placed on women. And so there's, there's that, right? Like, it's like, well, 
I, I think I want to be a homemaker. And it's like, okay, well, you're letting all of womanhood down. <laughs> right, right. <And laughs> Whereas the church is like, yes, do it. <laughs> that's what you're supposed to do. And it's, yeah. it's so true. And, you know, I remember like bouncing around like as a kid, like I want to be, a, everybody wants to be a vet when they're like five, but I don't want to be yes. a vet. I don't want to see any sick animals. Like, I just want to like pet the, the well ones. And I remember being like, I don't know, maybe I'll be a teacher. And my mom was like, oh my gosh, every like fourth grade Christian girl wants to be a teacher. Like, mm. like I don't know. And, and uh, I mm. ended up not really finding what I really liked to do until I had my first daughter. So I just kind of bounced uh-huh. around and then decided that I was really into birth work and started training to be a birth doula. Wow. Wow. That's interesting. I know nothing about that. Uh, That's what most people say. (laughs) Yeah, no. And I mean, like, uh, we have a friend that my wife was present when she gave birth, like it was a water birth. Oh, nice. So she was asked to go over to their house and help her with it. I don't really know what ensued, but. (laughs) Well, a baby came out. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess. And they have like seven kids. So. Oh, my goodness. At some point, I think it gets. I don't know if it gets easier or not, but I would hope so. I mean, it must if you keep going. <laughs> wow. So do you get like, do you get paid to be a doula then? Yes. And that is, uh, that's, I was going to say that's the best part. It's not the babies are the best part, but um, yeah. So I've, I've gone to a couple and I'm actually, I'm technically on call right now, um, oh, okay. but I think we're good. <laughs> um, I've got a, a friend do uh, supposedly also with the water birth, you know, at the end of mm. the month. And um, so that'll be fun. Had, you know, just, it's, I don't know. It, it's something that I truly just like fell in love with after having mine and, and learning and having a duel at my birth. And I just, it's just something that I ended up being like, oh man, I knew nothing with my first daughter. I'd love to be able to help, you know, people who had no clue what they were doing. And it's been very rewarding. It's really tiring when they're really long, but it's a lot of fun. Yeah, I'd imagine. I mean, like you're there in a very stressful and exciting situation. Right. Thank goodness so far, everything I've attended has gone very, very well. But between, you know, I've done a couple of hospitals, a couple of states, and this next one should be a home birth, which I'm excited about. But uh, yeah, it's been good. New life. Very cool. Um, So tell me a bit about your faith journey. Um, I I believe I was born on a Thursday, and I think I was in the nursery the next Sunday, um, like a (laughs) church nursery Uh right away. Uh Um, You know, my my parents uh, got saved together before um, either me or my brother were born. And, and uh, so it was just always a part of my life and always something that I was doing. And I think I was there probably for uh, probably three days a week. And then if my mom was working, sometimes I was there also. So I was, it was, it was literally everything, but when you don't have, you know, school also, like all my friends were there. I found my dance school through there, like everything just mm-hmm. all flowed from, from that. And, um, we were at the same place till I was like almost 16. There was some bouncing around and it really, it coming, leaving a place that I had been to for so long, it, it right, really right. made me like, okay, I have to stick with this. Right. You know, like I can't just go, Oh, well, you know, this, the rug has been pulled out from under me. You know, I, I can just go like, no, I don't want to find a new place. You know, it, it became about me and my faith journey and not just the crutch of going like church handles everything for me you know it was Mm -hmm. making sure that it was internalized so that's when your faith became your own Mm -hmm. yeah Yeah, I think so huh so did that like did anything change like so you were raised like was it like conservative evangelical uh so I grew up in a, a mini mega church I would say you know because mm. the island's small but the church was big and mm-hmm. um they were they were non-denominational evangelical so there wasn't a lot of I don't think there was much of a creed of like if you go to some place that's their you know e-free or their Lutheran brethren or they're this or they're that you can kind of know what they're about and this was right. pretty much just I don't want to say like made up but it was pretty much you know it was a church a family founded church same guy for a million years so it was um it was pretty conservative we did the uh oh my gosh the bill gothard like iblp stuff 
you know, we were allowed to wear pants and everything, but, um, you know, it was, Mm. it was fairly conservative, but it was more, um, the church structure, I think that was conservative than necessarily the biblical teaching. And, uh, as I got out of that, I started to like break that little cocoon and, and learn more. So was it like looking at the Bible a little bit differently then when you got out of that? I think so because, <clears throat> sorry. Um, yeah, I started to kind of just go like, wait a minute, that these verses weren't really in context, were they? Or this was, you know, kind of used to be scary. And I don't think it was meant that way. And uh, I mean, specifically, and I don't, I just remember growing up that like the verse, whether you go to the right or the left, you'll hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way like walk in it. I don't remember where it is, but to Mm -hmm. me, that was taught as this like scary voice of like, you need to know what you're doing because even if you go the wrong way, you're going to think you're going the right way. And only recently someone had taught it to me in a way that was like, no, if your intentions are good and you're following God and your intention is to listen and to follow him, you're going to be blessed whichever decision you make, as long as you're, you know, you're not going to miss God's will for your life. If you're, I mean, if you make a terrible, terrible choice, but you know, if you're just, Mm -hmm. if your intention is good and trying to follow, you'll do okay. And I was like, wait, no, that, that verse was there to scare me. Like it, Mm. it changed the filter of how I see um, scripture now, I think. So undoing some of those things. Yeah. Cause I, I know for me, like, yeah, same thing, like where it's like teenagehood where you start to make your faith your own. And um, I remember, I think it was when I was in college, I was like thinking about what's God's will? What's God's will? Right. How should I walk to work today? What's God's will for how I walk to work today? And I'm like, yeah, that's stupid. That's ridiculous. It's so true. Though. And I'm just like, you know what? That I don't think God cares. I don't, I don't think, think he cares which way I go well. to work today. Yeah. And I was like thinking... I wonder, I wonder how many other things I can then say, you know, he's just giving you an option, right? Right, right. And um, when I first moved to Calgary, um, so I moved from like way up north um, in Canada, um, down in a small town um, to a city, um, Calgary. And um, when I applied for work there, I basically had two different jobs that I interviewed for. And I always felt called to work in the church. Mm -hmm. Um, Like somebody told me, you're going to be a pastor. When you lay hands on people, amazing things are going to happen. In one case, another case, somebody said, you're going to be a worship pastor and all this stuff. And so I was like, okay, yeah, that's what am I supposed to do? God, should I drop everything and go to Bible college? And he's like, no, right. Right? And so anyway, so when I um, interviewed in Calgary for two different jobs, um, one of them, was as a finance person at a church. Oh, okay. And I was like, well, I'm a math major. I'm have an ed degree. Um, teaching did not work for me. Um, and so, so I interviewed for this and I didn't know what to sell them on. I'm like, hey, I'm a charismatic. Um, I'm Pentecostal. Mm-hmm. This is a Pentecostal church. I'll try to sell them on that. You know, right. it's almost like maybe I should speak to- in tongues for them. No, but, <laughs> but anyways, but yeah, so I, so I, uh, you know, I interviewed, tried to be all spiritual and stuff like that, but they were like, um, you know, this, this church is a little different than you're probably used to. And I'm like, oh, and they're like, yeah, so we're like, you know, we're open to a lot of people. And, you know, like if we, you know, if a gay person watched, walked into our church, we would be ready for that. Like that we would journey with them and all this stuff. And it was like, extremely progressive for its time because this is like 2008 yeah yeah and um and so and I'm like I don't know what I didn't really have a whole lot of thoughts about that okay um but they said hey like if you if you want to like be a part of our church um like if you are considering this before you even consider this we want you to attend one of our Sunday celebrations and I'm like well I have like a 12-hour job drive back and I need to be back in work on Monday so it didn't really work out for that and then the other job I interviewed for was industrial hygienist I didn't know what industrial hygiene was and I interviewed and I basically the whole interview I'm sitting here like well tell me why I want this job so I probably look way more confident than I really was 
Gotcha. And it just, I nailed it. And they were basically, they were ready to hire me. And I was like, wow. Okay. Right. And so I ended up taking the industrial hygiene job because it just, it made sense. Mm-hmm. But I also was like, had to, you know, talk to my wife on the phone and say like, yeah, I think I'm going to take the hygiene job. And she says, but you're giving up your dream. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not giving up my dream. Oh. I'm going to be a pastor. I'm going to be the pastor of the invisible church. And I'm like, right. I didn't even mm-hmm. know what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but it's funny because like the only reason why I went through this big long story is I was just thinking about how like when, um, When my wife got her teaching job, she was offered two positions. And you know what's crazy? Those two positions, one of them was in the same area of the city as the industrial hygiene job. Uh And the other one was in the same area of the city as that church that I didn't even consider the position for. And I felt like looking at it, I'm like, you could have taken either, John. Right. And it's like, wow, that's so cool. Like, that it's is like, cool. you don't usually you kinda, see like, oh, it would have been okay there too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. No, so that's I, good. I really believe that there's this burden that we place on people with calling and this burden that we place on people with this idea of um, what providence, right? And it's just like, that can be so dangerous. Yeah. Because yeah. you got this like poor kid that's trying to figure out how to get to work that day. And it's like, should I go this way or that way? Like, it's, it's yeah. so true. You know, I think of the pressure, you know, that I put either on myself or maybe, you know, that was put on us as kids. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, I-, I wish I could just let some of that go. You know, the little, the little kid who was like, oh, I, I'm playing with my friends, but I feel like I have to tell them about Jesus. I have to evangelize and make mm-hmm. sure. And I have to, you know. Yeah. And, you know, and there's nothing, nothing inherently wrong with that. But I felt so much pressure of, yeah, you know, if I was, you know, off playing with a friend of mine. And, you know, if I don't know, I played a game, I shouldn't have been like, I've ruined all my witness, you know, and, <laughs> yeah. and stuff like that. And you know what, sometimes you can just be a kid, it's fine. Yeah, well, and I mean, and it's different raising, you know, a new generation of Christians, too. Mm-hmm. And kind of watching my kids go through their struggles with faith, too. Sure. And How old are your kids? Uh, 16, 14, and 10. It's always the last one that you're like, oh. <laughs> Yeah. Well, 10 in May. 10 in May. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. And so, I mean, like, it's them making their faith their own or deciding what faith looks like for them. And I think for me too, it's like over the last, um, I guess, five years, I've still been figuring out what my faith is and where I'm at right now is kind of like, I deconstructed quite a bit. And then I decided, you know what? God is love. I'm going to go with that for a bit. Yep. And I feel like that's something that's so lost within right. kind of fundamentalism uh-huh. And I mean, like, not even to get into like what's happened politically, it's yeah. like there's in um, I'm actually I'm reading right now. Um, what's his name? Brian Zahn. Brian Zahn. Okay. Um, Sinners in the Hands of a Loving God. Okay. Like, I've heard of this them. is really articulating a lot of what my journey has been. <laughs> and it's just like, huh, you know, do we I'm have really to write that down so I can grab that one? Yeah, no, it's a great book. Okay, cool. Yeah, I actually got I got um, sinners in the hands of an angry God and sinners in the hands of a loving God. It's like, oh, she, nice. She gets me. You get bookends. Mm-hmm. So, but yeah, no, it's really interesting. I think maybe I'll once I'm done reading, I'll see if Brian Zahn wants to come on the podcast. You never know. Oh, nice. You know, you don't know if you don't ask. I got Keith Giles. That was amazing. Yeah, so, that's great. Yeah. Um, what are you reading right now? Hmm. Um, let's see. Well, I'm recertifying for uh doula work, so a mm-hmm. lot of birth books. Uh-huh. But um I just picked up I'm a little behind. I picked up uh Just Mercy and um oh, just a little bit in there. You know, I meant to yeah. read it last year, but you know, all the the stacks of books. And um I just got it from the library. Uh I think it's called Maybe You Should Talk to Someone. It's like oh, a, okay. a 
therapist and her therapist or something like that. And there's a box of tissues on the cover. So I'm looking forward to that one. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Emotional health. That's a huge thing too. I think that's something we could probably different <laughs> talk about for a while. I'm like so that's big on mental health. For sure. Um, one of my, my favorite books, and I, I did a podcast episode on it is, um, emotional agility. Okay. And, um, it's like uh, Susan David and I see her on Twitter all the time and I retweet her regularly. Um, and like my favorite quote of hers is emotions are data, not directives. That's so good. I've heard the yeah. variants of it and I'm pretty yeah. sure I used it on my son a couple of days ago. Yeah. And he was so upset about something and I was like, no, no, no. These are feelings. It's information. It's telling yeah. you how you feel. It's not telling yeah. you how to act. Like you can be disappointed, yeah. but you can't, you know, go throwing stuff. But um, yeah. yeah, that's been something I've been trying to figure out of like, no, my, my feelings are telling me and just yeah. trying to, if I can stop and go, all right, I'm actually kind of scared about that. Or, you know, yeah. but I'm really disappointed. And, and like, a, like I'm trying to teach him, you know, to put names to it and you know, even that as a, as an adult has been tremendous to learn. Yeah. And I think this is a difference in men and women too. Like, I think like with like guys that talk about emotions seems like a rarity. Mm -hmm. And then like with women, it's like, it's almost like, well, you, you are only emotion. <laughs> and it's like, right. And that's like just been like the most toxic thing about Christianity is that it's they kind true, of though. like guys are way. like angry or happy and women yeah. have 8,000 emotions. I think that's really, really true. There's we get put in these weird little pegs. Well, yeah. And it's funny, too, because I see like with my my kids, you know, like um, my, my my oldest kids, they're both in high schools and they've got like. Right they've got transgender friends, you know, gay friends, and there's all of that. And I kind of look at that and I'm like, okay, well, like when you talk about like gender dysphoria, um, I question how much of it has to do with the fact that someone doesn't feel like they're completely male or mm -hmm. they don't feel like they're completely female because they don't fit whatever those expectations are. Mm -hmm. And I've kind of always said to my boys, it's like, you rock whatever kind of masculinity you are. Sure. Um, my oldest is is a rock star. And so he likes to like paint his nails and put, you know, wear makeup and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm like, okay, yeah, he's doing him. I wouldn't do, do it, sure. but like whatever, right? Yeah. Um, but it's like, I think it's, um, I think our society as a whole has done people a disservice on gender by, you know, really kind of relegating women to like, okay, you're, you're this object for men. And right, then right. like kind of society saying like for men, it's like, well, that's, you know, it's like guys are supposed to pursue lots of women. And it's like the more right. women, the more of a man you are. And then yeah. like, you know, it's kind of like, there was like, there was a Christian movement of masculinity that was kind of saying, you know what, as the church, we feminized men too much. Let's teach yeah. them to be warriors. And so there was that kind of movement. And mm -hmm. man, I, I loved that movement at the time. And I, I'm realizing it's like, yeah, that wasn't me. Um, and it's like just kind of figuring out what masculinity really is. Right. But it's like, I think I'd rather think about what personhood really is. It's mm -hmm. like, because like emotionally speaking, like we may be able to say that men have more of a tendency to be this way. Um, and it's hard to say how much of that is nature and how much is that, that is nurture. And I would say the same thing about women. It's like how much of it is nature and how much of it is nurture. And people want to debate that, you know, all the time. When in reality, I really feel like we should just let people be, right. you know? And it's like, can you, can you sit with that? Right, right. How do you sit with this? And it's mm. like, I'm feeling sad. Okay, sit with that for a bit. Yeah. And stop stuffing it. Stop stuffing it, absolutely. And, you know, we the fact of how much we, we change over years, you know, to be like, well, I feel, you know, I don't know, however I felt in high school, I remember being an idiot in a car <laughs> in high school and being like 17 and being like, oh yeah, I totally feel like I'm ready to be married soon and mm. I'm gonna have kids. And 
I meant it. Like, I really thought I was so much more mature than this person that I was like, no, no, no. I really feel like God's preparing me. And then I look back and I'm like, I'm so st-. like, I was a baby. I was such a little kid, you know, thinking this stuff and, and the ways that I feel adult or the ways that I'll feel feminine or the ways that I feel, um, peaceful or any kind of those, like just the things that make me, me have changed so much over a few years. Like I can't imagine being a kid at getting all those messages and then getting all these options and getting like whatever and dealing with all that. And, you know, so in some ways I'm like, okay, I'm glad I was kind of funneled into something because I'm easily overwhelmed. But then as I became an adult and I think as my brain was, you know, more formed to make decisions, being able to go, okay, what's actually for me? What's not just what I was taught. That's something I'm trying to stop myself from saying, oh, well, I was taught blah, blah, blah. Like, no, what do I actually think? What have I really learned? Not just, well, I was taught to think this way, or I was taught this is supposed to be that, you know, we change so much. It's, I guess we're supposed to, that's the whole thing. Yeah. Well, and I always, I I like being older. (laughs) You know, it's like funny because I, I I was going to do this. I, I think I was going to do this as one of my TikTok things is I was going to be like, being older is kind of like being from the future. You know, it's like <laughs> when you, so when you talk about your kids, I'm like, oh, well, this is what's <laughs> going to happen 10 years from now, you know? And it's so, terrible. but like, I, I think, you know, like, I guess it must have been late thirties where it's like, I actually became comfortable in my own skin. Mm-hmm. and it's like there was a lot of self-discovery and right. it's funny like I get bashed so much for talking about Enneagram oh do you yeah and it's oh, like gosh. like you know it's like even you know I was like in a family conversation with my sister-in-law and she's like oh I've been told not to talk to you about Enneagram and I'm like not to talk to you really uh, yeah. okay and I'm like well that's unfortunate but it's like kind of that realization, like kind of that breakthrough of understanding, oh, this is why I do what I do, right? And yeah. like me knowing that it's like, I am emotionally driven and I'm a dude, right? <laughs> right? And just kind of like, okay, all right. So understanding why, like it was, I guess for me, like what happened is I went from a small company and I started working at a big corporation mm-hmm. and I was working downtown. I had to actually wear like dress clothes and stuff. It was very different, big change for me, but I was like, oh, this is cool because um, i become so casual at the other company that it's like, I wanted them to be comfortable working with the Christian and right. <laughs> that's not always good. Um, <laughs> I made them really comfortable. Like they could say anything around me, right? Exactly. Um, but anyways, yeah, so so when I started working downtown, it's like a very different role because I'm not the senior guy anymore. And I took like a personality test while I was there. And mm-hmm. it's like this colors test. I don't know oh. if you've heard of it, but it's like insights. Actually, okay. I have the brick here. There's a visual for a non-visual. Oh, podcast. cool. Okay. But it's like I'm Theater green, blue, red, and yellow, right? Mm-hmm. And so green is like, I care about you. Do you care about me? And then next thing is details. And then... Red is be brief and be gone. Okay. And then yellow is like, involve me. Okay. I don't know if that's right. Anyway, I don't know if I have these in the right order, but it doesn't matter. Any, the main thing is the green said, I care about you. Do you care about me? And I was like, well, that's interesting because when I was junior at the other company, I would like really be hard on the junior employees when they didn't do things right. And I'm like, why was I like that then? Because right. according to this test, I'm emotionally driven. And then I, and you, you know, I was doing Enneagram at the same time too and finding I'm a four, right? And um, the realization I made is that the reason why I didn't like those juniors, you know, slacking on their work is that it made it harder for the people I work for. Mm-hmm. And so I was looking at them like, you're making yeah. this guy's j- job harder. And so again, it was emotionally driven. And so it's like starting to understand what makes me tick. I'm like, why am I 
why do I have people on my podcast to talk to? Because I want to understand them emotionally, right? Like I want to understand right. what it's like to be a stay-at-home mom or, you know, right, like, right, right. and so um, making that realization was just so huge for me because I'm like, okay, now I'm starting to understand my purpose. Right. And my purpose is bridge building. And it's a very frustrating time to be a bridge builder. Mm. Oh, Gosh, that's got to, yeah, building bridges when we can't really even connect that much. I mean, that's got to be like painting houses in the rain, you know, I can't believe, oh, that's tough. Well, um, like, like on social media, right? Like, it's yeah, like, we still it, have it, that. There's a Thank lot goodness. of that, but it's, it, um, I don't know, it's interesting because what, I, what I've encountered now is like, I think I, I was very, um, I guess I like to just call myself uncaged. And that's the name of my album, Uncaged. But it's like kind of the idea is like I'm I'm uncaged spiritually. And so I kind of look at it and I'm like, there's people that are like, well, that's not that's not Christianity. And I look at it, I'm like, well, it's a really good idea though. Like, you know, okay, Buddha, yeah. Buddha said it's not about the destination, it's the journey. And it's like, I think we need to focus on the journey. And it's like, oh, but Buddha said that. Like we can't, and I'm like, no, 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 guys, break out right. of the cage. There's some wisdom, take it. Yeah, right? there's there's good stuff to be found, you know, everywhere. And I think, you know, even there's a lot of critics of the Enneagram. I find it useful. Yeah. I found it more useful than Myers-Briggs. I'm an INFJ mm. and that's very like, here's how I'll behave. Here's what you'll see based on mm. me. You'll see me, you know, have this INFJ behavior, but the more and what more- is, What is INFJ? Oh, introverted. Uh, I think sure. it's basic. No. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, <laughs> there's like a sensitive thinking judging like it's some it's it's very much the infj version of a four it's it's uh mm. there's a lot of overlap um but it's it it's more behavior when you do like a myers-briggs but learning more about the four has made a lot more sense i'm also a four um yeah. and in the i think it's been easier to work on what's not working for me when mm -hmm. I'm able to go like, oh, well, but I'm doing that because of this. Like, it's I don't see it as the label of like, oh, well, I'm a four and this is how I'm gonna be, but I'm able to go like, oh man, I feel terrible or I made that bad choice. All right, well, what in a four's makeup is gonna make me do that or feel that way? And how can I work yeah. on that part of it? You know, and I'm a four married to an eight. So that's, uh, that's interesting there. <laughs> and what is eight again? Eight is, um, it's it's the one everybody thinks is mean. I can't think of it's like the uh, oh the reformer. It's something. It might yeah I think so. But they're always like really driven. They come off as really pushy because they're supposed to, they come off as controlling, but their their fear is being controlled. The challenge. So that's like where that comes in. The ch yeah that's that's aptly named for sure. <laughs> Interesting. But if yeah. you look it up, it's yeah if you look up the the uh, fragile little like four made of feelings and the yeah. the eight it just says good luck <laughs> but uh, uh, we're very very different but it works yeah well and I, it's I, been I useful it's... understanding him a lot with that one and i i found with like the colors thing um mm. that it's like the be brief and be gone are like mm. my favorite people like i'm like i'm just like okay cool like so you want me to dumb it down and just tell you what i need and or okay. what you need to know and then i can leave and i'm like okay cool <laughs> Right, right. Then I can get back to my own world. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? exactly. And I've taken less of my energy and time. Yeah, and I think like that, and I maybe I have an emotional understanding of that too. I'm like, okay, this person just needs what they, you know, right. as little as possible from me. And it's like, I can do that. Mm -hmm. I can make their life a little easier. I guess I spend a lot of time trying to figure out how to make everybody's life a little easier. And... Mm -hmm. But that works to my detriment because it's like, okay. well, I don't want to inconvenience that person. And so I'm not always real with people. Okay. All right. I can, I'll do, I, yeah, I've got the, uh, the chameleon and that's an INFJ thing also kind of, you know, mm, the chameleon. It sounds so new agey, but to be like, I match energies, you know, and I think that actually helps with some of my birth work because there's uh -huh. moms that are nervous and I'll be like, no, 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 we're going to be really chill. And then there are moms yeah. that are like, I just want to party. And I'm like, 
me too. Let's have fun. Let's put on music, you know? So just trying to kind of match and figure out, I can read the tone of a room and just like slip right in and everything's fine. So I just kind of, okay, well, we'll just match this and we'll keep you happy and calm and I'll stay happy and calm. And we'll, uh, we'll all I, be good. I totally get that. And then you get like, cause like for me, it's like every work site I go to, right. I'll get in, I'll read the room. I have to, like, it's my job. Yeah. Yeah. Because what I need to do now is get a bunch of oil field dudes to put on a pump that I'm going to put on them for the day. And at the end of the day, I'm going to ask them what they did mm -hmm. and hope to get good answers so I can say, this is what my data is, them doing this, yeah. right? Um, and so I'll get into, I remember I went to this one site where not only did I have to put a pump on the dude, but I also had to interview him about his job and ask him questions. And you could just see in the room when the guy walked in, it's like, this is the guy you don't want to talk to. I'm like, <laughs> okay. all right. So what I did is he's like, well, I don't have time right now. And I'm like, okay, no, that's fine. Uh, I'm just going to put the pump on you and we'll talk later. And so he left. I sat down. I looked at my interview questions and I'm like, how many of these questions can I answer myself without talking? Okay. to him? And then I ended up with like only four questions I needed to answer. Nice. <laughs> and so then he comes back in and I'm like, all right, boom, boom, boom. And then we were done. I'm like, I interacted with him as little as possible. And it's like, I just knew, right? Like That's you could, you can the room, you can, you can find that energy. And yeah, I, I love how new agey that sounds. I, it does. I, it's, just, it's just so much fun to me to like make Christians uncomfortable with that. It's like, is he, <laughs> is he new agey? It's like, yeah, I'm not even going to apologize for that. I know I had texted somebody and I was like, don't tell anyone, but I'm reading the secret and I kind of like it. And they were like, <laughs> I already read it. Don't worry. You know? I was like, look, this is not my religion now, but I'm not going to focus on negative. I will focus on more positive, but it, yeah, it was totally like, I remember like sermons about the secret. What's the secret? It's evil. Like, and, uh, I don't know. There's value in a lot of stuff. If you make anything yeah. too important, it's a problem, but there's nothing wrong with taking some wisdom from a lot of sources. As my favorite heretic likes to say, Rob Bell, he says, mm -hmm. everything is yours. Um, mm. actually, I think he used a scripture to back that up, that everything is yours. And it's like, I just, I really believe that God can speak through everything. And so I don't want to limit myself to this text, this ancient text. Okay. Yeah. Which now I'm, now I'm being heretical, but I don't know. <laughs> There's times where like people are having these conversations and they're like, all right, this woman is being beaten by her husband. Now I need to find a scripture that tells us what we need to do. And it's like, no, get her out of that house. I don't right. care what the Bible says. Get her out of that house. I completely you know? agree. Absolutely. And there are people <laughs> who would be like, no, she needs to stay. You know, not <laughs> yeah. even the committee. There's plenty of people who'd be like, well, she's doing something wrong there then, isn't she? You know? Yeah. I, uh, yeah. No, just just get out. I think, yeah, there's there's definitely it, a time and place for, for all of that. And it's so tough because it's just kind of, I look at that and I'm like, well, this is what makes sense to me. And if you can find a scripture to back it up, that's great. But I am not, I just, I can't force myself to read the Bible the way these people are. You know, it's kind of like death penalty. And it's like, we really want the death penalty. There's a scripture that says, I'm like, you know what? Jesus died for our sins. I don't think we need to have anybody else die for their sins. I'm, I'm, and I may be reading the Bible wrong, but I don't care. You know, I'm with I you want on. less killing. Yes, I, I recently <laughs> came to the, I hadn't given it a ton of thought, but, and it was probably yeah. literally from watching Just Mercy and I was like yeah. sobbing and I was like, you know yeah. what? No, the government yeah. doesn't need to take a life. We need yeah. to, you know, just, you know, and I don't care how bad it is. I'm sorry. You know, I, I would hope that if it was God forbid my own family, I'd be able to say still, no, vengeance is the Lord's. And, you know, I don't think the government can end us, you know, end a, a human life, but you know, yeah, it's plus less killing. Let's just, and if you look for these, you know, we, we fight with a lot of this, not fight, but we talk to a lot of the same people on Instagram. And sometimes mm -hmm. I'm like, you, you had your thought and you went to the Bible to find something that um, confirmed it. And we've mm -hmm. all done stuff like that. That's fine. But, you know, I'm trying to you know, go through it and see what it says 
and then form your opinion from there rather than having your opinion and looking for the Bible to affirm it for you, you know, trying to come up with reading it that way, you know, I, uh, just trying to read like, you know, like the words of Jesus more than and I, the whole Bible is important, you know, but I'm like, well, what, what would he say if he was here with me, if he was here with us, if he walked through my town and I was like, whoa, that guy's the son of God, you know, that would be enough mm. for for me forever you know like that would if I believed in him that would be it if I didn't hear somebody else's opinion and study and the root word of whatever I met Jesus (laughs) so that's enough and maybe not in the flesh but I met Jesus and that's enough you know yeah my sheep know my voice that's right it's one of my one of my favorite experiences um as a father Mm. um was when my oldest was first born and it was immediate, it was a cesarean. Um, and they took him to get a bath for the first time. Mm. And up until he was born, I would read to him at night while he's, while he was in his mama. Yeah. And, um, I remember when he was in the bath, um, he was crying, like he was hysterically crying uh-huh. and I'm like, it's okay, buddy. And he stopped crying. And I looked at the nurse and I'm like, is he okay? And she's oh. like, yeah, no, he's fine. He recognizes your voice. And I was like, what? I know. <laughs> and it was like, and I mean, it's an incredible, like, that's a really weird experience too. Like I always assume like with women, it's like, you've carried this child all this time, instant connection. Right. Um, for a man, you're kind of like, that's, that's my child. Like you're right, seeing it for right. the first time and you're like, I, it's hard for me to conceptualize that, that like mm. somehow this child came from me. Right. And I think like for me, like learning how to bond with my child was, was quite the process. Right. Right. We see that. We see that a lot with ours. Um, I had like severe postpartum depression after my mm. first was born. Um, and so it took a, a bit for us to bond. She actually probably bonded with my husband first more, but you know, she knew his voice right away. Um, That's really cool. And then you just keep, you see it even more as they grow up. You see that like, look, he stands with like one foot on top of the other, like me, you know, or like, look, he's making that face that you make or driving me crazy. Like he drove your mom crazy. Like you drove your parents, you know, nuts. Mm. And, um, you know, you see like, you guys are sitting the same, you know, you really start to see like the family traits pass down, but it's, it's true. You know, there's that little, like that just came out of me. This is real. But I think those dad moments tend to come like a little bit later sometimes. Yeah. Well, it's the baby bond is amazing. Yeah. And then I, I mean, learning how to connect with each kid. Cause like, I think for me, it's like, there's, you know, the parents that are so self-involved, they don't know how to connect with the kids. And then there's the parents that do kind of like force child time, you know, it's like, okay, come on, boy, you're coming with me. We're going to, we're going to go fishing. It's like, I don't want to go fishing. And it's like, you have to come. It's, it's guy time or whatever. Right. And it's like being able to, I was trying to figure out, I'm like, okay, well, I want to do what my kid wants to do. I want to be a good dad. And so I want to do what my kid wants to do. And so when, you know, the kid was little, it was like, we would just do the, like the most boring stuff ever that he enjoyed. And I realized after a while, I'm like, well, I'm going to start to resent him if Mm. I keep doing this. And so then I started to learn how to connect, you know, in ways where we both enjoyed it. Okay. And I've been doing that ever since. And it's just like, kids are great. Like, it's like just figuring out how to connect with each child. Right. And each child's different. You know, it's got like, I got the rock star. I've got the like computer genius who started a Shrek cult on TikTok. Oh my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Actually that might, family, be pass- huh? <laughs> that might be passe now. So, but, <laughs> but he's, he's doing like 3d rendering and all this stuff. Oh, wow. Okay. And my daughter is actually writing a really cool story for school. Um, it's like about people that live on islands and there's rich people, poor people and people in between. And there's like messages and bottles. Anyways, this, I'm like, that this sounds, sounds so fascinating. Cool. So like, just to see what my kids create, right? It's like, this is amazing. And, um, but yeah, being able to connect with them where they're at and then trying to foster that creativity and figure out how we can, you know, it's like being a good producer. A good producer doesn't put their thumbprint on everything. 
they figure out how to make each band sound the most right. themselves. And I really yeah. believe that's what parenting is. Um, but that's hard because that means yeah. you're going to take some risks spiritually yeah. and yeah. your child may walk away from their faith sure. because you haven't been pounding it into them all the time. Right. And so, uh, so that's, that's the struggle. Right. And it's, it's like, so crazy trying to figure that balance of like, I've got to give you this good foundation, but also I don't want to choke you. <laughs> you know, that's yeah. so tough. And I mean, and the tough thing that I've been encountering when you talk about like bridge building okay. is like kind of looking at how, like what's gone down politically and how like, it's been like, well, we need to support this guy so we can stop abortion. Right. And it's like, no, we know he uses bad words. We know that he's very crass, but his, yeah. his rules, his laws that he's trying to bring are On far this more biblical. Mm -hmm. And it's funny, yeah, because I, I just, I actually just listened to one of my friend's podcasts on, it was like a Facebook Live thing. And he was mm -hmm. like saying, everything about Trump is more biblical than Biden. And I'm like, <laughs> that's so interesting because my friend Keith Giles would say, I would rather live in a Christ-like world than a biblical world. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's Yeah. Great. And it's like, because he, he looks at the Bible and he sees like, there's, there's like, there's um, genocide. There's women being treated as property. Right. Like there's all these things that yeah. it's just like, huh. And uh, I remember, actually, I put that quote on Facebook um, a long time ago. And it was before I had Keith on my podcast and somebody replied with like, has this guy read the Bible? <laughs> And so I asked him when he came on the podcast, so Keith, have you read the have Bible? Read the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's really interesting. Like, so these more progressive theologians like Keith, and I'm seeing with Brian Zahn when I'm reading his book now, I'm like realizing this guy used to be like such a fundamentalist. And the more he read the Bible, he became more progressive. And, right. and I guess what I'm finding is really interesting is like people want to say progressive Christianity does not exist because God doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't think the argument is that God is that God changes. No. I think the argument is that humanity's revelation of God changes. Right. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. And so, and that is probably dangerous territory <laughs> because but, people want to say like, well, yeah, no, no, no. If you look at well, the Bible. Well, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Brings the, uh, my least favorite phrase. It's the slippery slope into <laughs> like, no, 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 no. Maybe I can just also have a little bit of freedom and a little bit of elbow room. It doesn't have to be a slippery slope. Yeah. Slippery slope. The slippery slope argument is a slippery slope. I don't even know if that makes sense, but that might be profound. I, I'm not sure. You'll tweet that out. Someone will tell you you're wrong. Yeah, that'd be good. Do you so do you find like uh, Twitter as like a negative space or do you find it kind of a positive place or is it somewhere in between? I I find Facebook way more negative. Yes, um, me too. Yeah, it's Facebook I find it is way evil. more toxic. Mm -hmm. Um I I took a good chunk of time and just deactivated for a while. I was mm -hmm. I was I was obsessed with correcting people and like not even yeah. like grammar, like I just couldn't yeah. stop like well, that's wrong. Well, that's this. And some of it was political and some of it was religious. And I was like, you know what? I am a child <laughs> and all I can do is take it away from myself. I don't have the self-control. So I totally deactivated for a while. I gave it back to myself for a little bit, but I don't keep it on my phone. So I'm on it that's one or smart. two times a day. If it's, I was like, you know what? There's no emergencies that are going to come from Facebook. Someone can call me if there's, if there's a problem. Twitter, I, I mostly just see people I follow and like, and I'm really, that sounds like I'm there for the, for the echo chamber, but people that are life giving or people that mm -hmm. I'm learning from mm -hmm. occasionally yeah. the thing pops up where I'm like, Oh, you're such a jerk. Like, why can't you just be nice? But it's really more in the Facebook space. And then, you know, Instagram's just fun. Cause I like those little uh, greyhounds that wear clothes. Oh, I haven't seen that. <laughs> I honestly, I yeah. barely look at anything on Instagram. I just go there to post memes. I love them all. <laughs> oh, it's ridiculous. Well, lately I've been doing TikTok videos though too. And it's just like a little brief blurb on something. So I think I'm the last TikTok holdout. 
You know, yeah. I, I think I downloaded it when there was uh, whispers that it was going to be like banned because of yeah. China or whatever. Yeah. I was like, oh, maybe I'll have a, a cool phone that has a banned app on it. And then that'll be a value. But I just I'll watch a video if someone sends it to me. But if I were to download it, I would just never stop scrolling and watching all these videos. I, yeah, I got to draw is, the line somewhere. <laughs> it is pretty addictive. And I'm not like big on video content. Um, mm -hmm. it's taken me a while to even consider like creating video content. Cause I'm like, okay. who sits and watches people talk to each other. And, it's, right. and I think there's a lot of people that are like, well, who listens to people talk to each other? And I'm like, I'm doing laundry. I'm driving. I listen to podcasts all the time. All the time. So, um, so you listen to a lot of podcasts. You're probably like me. Um, <laughs> What's I your, think so. I don't listen to a ton that are current. Like I find older ones or ones that are like oh, two years old and I'll binge and oh, then I'm caught up and then I have to wait. But oh. then, you know, so if it's like, what do you listen? I'm like, well, I kind of, I wait for relevant. I wait for this one, but yeah. I've been into like the really gritty crime ones and I don't know why, but it's like my favorite thing in the world. And I, I'm so like sensitive. I shouldn't, but I'm always like, like tugging on my husband like babe did you hear oh my gosh you have to hear about this grizzly murder and he's like don't do this to yourself but for some reason it, it I enjoy it there's like kind of a, was a twitter thing where people were talking about what their only fans would have which obviously you don't yeah. want to make it porn right but sure. um but I was like my only fans would be me talking to my kids about something cool I learned on a podcast okay so is there something cool you've learned on a podcast of late? Wow. I, I'm totally, see, I just, I do it for like literally amusement, like to not think. Oh, really? I so it's not, a, it's not a thinky thing. I mean, like, for me, it's, it's very much a thinky thing, right? Like I'll listen to podcasts. It's very much a thinking thing, but like, yeah. I mean, like the crime stuff I fill my, my brain with. You know, it's <laughs> funny. I like, cause I, I kind of force myself to listen to stuff I disagree with a lot. Mm, okay. Um, and so like for a while I was listening to the Steven Crowder podcast, which was just <laughs> such a train wreck. Um, and it's funny cause like my son was trying to do the same thing cause he's, he's more liberal than I am. And so he's just like, I can't listen to Steven Crowder. I'm like, no, I understand. Like, I think he did some like ableist jokes where I was like, I can't listen to this anymore. Uh -huh. But I remember um, they were talking about like the whole, um, background checks and psychological evaluation of um, gun owners, right? Okay. And they're like, here's where it fails. And mm -hmm. they explained that what's gonna happen is people that wanna buy guns are gonna hide their mental illness and not get treatment because they wanna have a gun. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my gosh, like I would never think of that. And right. Yeah. yeah. And so I was like, I, th I think if I was to say like, there's something that comes to mind, it's like, and that's from like, probably like a year ago that I listened to that. But gotcha. I was like, I just think there's so much value in getting different perspective on things. Mm. And it's like, and it creates, I think it's, it's like, um, you know, as a musician, it's like, I want to listen to so much different music that I create something that's very interesting. Right. And so like podcasting wise, it's like, if I can listen to a wide spectrum of podcasts, I can create something, create a conversation that's different, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's what kind of what I strive for, right? I've been listening to, yeah, a lot of conservative stuff just because I'm like so, so easy for me to understand the left side of things. Okay. And so I spend right, a lot right. of time kind of <laughs> in the conservative areas. Um, I was listening okay. to all these like pro MacArthur you know, let's do super spreader event people. Oh gosh, I can't, I can't. I <laughs> yeah, can't. <laughs> I just found out that one of my friends too, he, he's, he's got COVID now and he lives with his parents and his parents are elderly. And I'm just mm. like, this is, this is a bad scene. So oh, gosh, yeah, thinking and praying about him because it's like, yeah, they've all got it except for one. So, oh wow the son and the mother have it and the father doesn't so gotcha but <sighs> it's it's been kind of like this and like i guess what's really getting me about so much of this is like i think back to like matthew paul turner used to have a used to have like kind of this branding thing where he called it like jesus needs new pr 
Oh yeah. Yeah. And I think that's really influenced the way I look at so much right now Mm. because I see it in my kids too. Their struggle with their faith is that the PR for Jesus is terrible. Yeah. And it's like, you know, it's like to be a Christian, you have to be homophobic. You have to be anti-science. You have to be like, there's all these things that I'm like, that don't speak love. Mm -hmm. And I got into this conversation with a guy on Twitter about it. Um, because I was kind of like saying, okay, this, this lock guy, Greg lock yes. is, is a real piece of work in my he opinion. Pops up in my timeline all the time. <laughs> I'm like, why are you still here? And he's the guy that's just like, we need the second amendment to protect our first amendment. I'm like, pew, pew, right. And, um, <laughs> that's exactly what he sounds like. I heard um, it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so my friend, Jeff Dornick who I've been on his show, I've had him on my show. Um, He and I went back and forth about it. And um, I kind of reached a point where I'm like, no, here's the thing is people like that, him and Sean, I don't know how to say his last name. Fuck. Yeah, I I won't (laughs) attempt that one either. I feel like the two of them and then like maybe Matt Walsh make like the trifecta of like (laughs) Twitter pains in the butt for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's like, so I went back and forth with him and it got to a part where I was just so frustrated because I'm just like, no, here's the thing, man. Like you guys, the way that you're talking, I don't even want to hear what he has to say. Like, I don't want to hear what he has to say. How is this guy going to spread the gospel? I'd say the same thing about Franklin Graham too. I'm like, who wants to hear what they have to say aside from people that already agree with them? And it's like, what right. kind of garbage evangelism are you doing? Right, right, right. Nobody wants to hear what you have to say. But, but then, it, you know, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to be seeker friendly. We don't want to, like, yeah. preach an easy gospel. Oh, yeah. Like, it's, it's such a trap. There's nothing ever makes sense. We don't want to be seeker friendly. We want to be seeker hostile. <laughs> right. <laughs> and they'll, they'll love us for how bold and in your face we are. Absolutely. Yeah. They, I love being yelled at for, you know, from strangers for what I do wrong. That, that convinces me there's a savior who loves me. Well, and, and yeah. And so I think that was what was incredible to me. I think that's what more than anything has really pushed me into this whole, like, God is love. Mm-hmm. And then it's like, okay, next stage, Jesus is the way. And I'm like, okay, is Jesus is the way like this kind of you know, like, I don't like the Sunday school version of this that says, like, you know, it's like, let's bash Muhammad, let's bash Buddha, let's bash all these other ideas and be like, no, only this magic word, right? And it's like, and that's so kind of learning, you know, thinking about how, like, it's like Jesus models the way to love. If mm-hmm. God is love, it's like Jesus is modeling the way to love, right? right. Like the truth, the life. And I'm so, I'm still kind of wrapping my mind around this and trying to like, as I kind of reconstruct everything, I'm like, this is what I'm building right now. But it really took me back talking to my friend, Jeff, because he's just like, I could not get through to him. I could not get through to him and help him understand the kind of perspective that I know in people I've interacted with on Twitter, in people, you know, in my own family, it's like, no, you guys are turning people off from the gospel. And the way that I said it, I was like, they don't want to hear the gospel gospel because of people like you. Mm-hmm. And he kind of said, no, they don't want to hear the gospel because their hearts are evil. And I'm like, uh, I think I'm done here. <laughs> I think I think it's good. But it's I like, mean, yeah. there's a real spiritual stronghold there. And I don't know how much of it is nationalism. It may be nationalism, but there's just something that's like very, very huge there. And I I, I think, you know, like, it's really hard to turn this because there's kind of this fixation with the fact that there are people murdering babies. Right. Right. And I think that's the, that's the thing that makes it impossible to build that bridge because it's like the Democrats have gone full pro-choice. 
right and right. they're taking it as far as they possibly can so every yeah. time you bring anything up like even the death penalty they're like yeah but what about all the innocent babies and it's like uh well i'm not a democrat i'm i'm uncaged i'm uncaged politically so you guys can like whatever but check the just, uncaged box when you register yeah, i check the uncaged <laughs> box when i read we don't even i i like we don't even do that like does everybody yeah, registered do? in 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 america y- yeah. you have to join a party like um so uh, you don't have to but like once you turn 18 you can and um, you can register to vote without joining a party but then you can't vote in your primaries um but you can still vote in like general um elections so like but, so there's yeah. a wide like a lot of people vote in the primaries like with with us it's like generally in canada it's like you you just like go to the polls and you vote for like whoever. Um, And, but like the political parties themselves, they will have periodically, I guess there's like leadership reviews, Mm -hmm. but you can have a leader that just like is in in power forever, right? Because we don't have term limits, right? And yeah, so like basically we don't have like, Every four years, there's primaries. Like, I'm assuming every okay. four years, you guys have primaries, right? I like, that's four and two and six. Like, yeah, I know yeah. the president's every four. Everything else, ugh, I have no clue. Yeah. Homeschool served me well when it came to, uh, <laughs> to my civic duties. <laughs> so, so basically, yeah. So, so like, if I, like, when I was a young conservative, um, I, I went to a church and there was like this guy Stockwell Day was preaching at there right and Stockwell Day was this guy that was like the liberals had run Canada for like forever Mm -hmm. and Stockwell Day was a Christian man which was like it's weird to think that this happened in Canada because it sounds very American but it's like he's a Christian man he came and spoke at the church and I was like oh man like if I vote for this guy we can stop homosexuality we can stop (laughs) Right, right. You know, we can stop abortion, like all this stuff, right? And this was like oh, so many years ago. Um, <laughs> I want to say like 2001 or 2002. And so I was like, oh man, no, we need to get this guy. Like they were going to unite like a couple of the conservative parties to build a bigger party that would be able to actually take on the liberal party, right? Okay. So I was like, okay, I'm going to join. I'm going to join the Canadian Alliance so I can vote this guy in so that he becomes the party leader. So I actually joined the party at that time. And it was the Canadian Alliance sounds yeah. so cool, by the way. Like <laughs> it's almost like the Christian and Missionary Alliance. Yes. Yeah. Very yeah, Christian. Cool name. Yeah. And so, anyways, yeah. So that guy, he was like, he was like doing photo ops with his jet ski and everything. And I just thought he was the coolest guy ever. Um, so like when you talk about like who you were, you know, when you were younger, like me in right. my twenties, me in my twenties, not very smart. Um, and so I really got into this and I joined the party and everything like that. And then when Stockwell Day became the leader of that party, at some point, like they lost the election. And at some point there was like basically a, a whole bunch of people that resigned from the party. And I think they were starting their own party. Oh goodness. And I was like, they should call it the mutiny party. Like I was (laughs) mad. Yeah. And, um, Eventually what happened is, oh, wait, I'm trying to think. I might be telling you the wrong history here. They did unite something. No, Canadian Alliance. But anyways, eventually what happened is he lost the leadership. Stephen Harper took the leadership and he built a bigger party by uniting, I guess, more parties. And I hope, well, it's mostly Americans that listen to this, so they'll just believe me. Um, <laughs> you know nothing about you guys. And you're uh, there, your prime minister is real handsome, right? But other than yeah, that, yeah. we don't know what's up. We don't know so, what's going on. So yeah, so Stephen Harper, he ruled Canada for like a long time, and then eventually he lost to Justin Trudeau, <laughs> and then he lost the leadership, and so then they had to do a whole like party revote thing to get the leadership and. I didn't participate in that and I have not been a member of a party ever since. Ever since. I'm like, I realize there's no such thing as God's party. Um, right. 
Gary, gay marriage is legal. It's been legal in Canada longer than anything else. And my gosh, looking back now, I'm just like, why, why did I need to stop that? <laughs> like, why did we ever think legislating what we feel is moral was like a good idea? Because even, you know, there's plenty of people that I talk to and I'm like, you know, I, I was a good Christian kid. I was such a goody goody. I'm still pretty much, you know, I'm too afraid to do anything too bad, yeah, but I'm yeah. still too much for some people. So I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't too, uh, I love, I love my brethren, you know, but I'm like, oh, too many Christians in power freaks me out. Cause I don't, I don't need you to legislate your morality on me yeah. that you might not like what I do. You know, you might yeah. like that I drink sometimes or I have a potty mouth, you know, but yeah. um, so as much as I, I'm a, even if it was somebody Christian in power trying to make things more Christian, that doesn't mean it's, is, you know, it's their interpretation of it. That, that stuff kind of freaks me out. And then apparently, again, we can call anybody a Christian as long as they're against abortion and uh, you know, well, yeah. And it's like, the love is gone and it's like, and we're against love. Christians are against love. And when you speak against certain people getting married to each other, it's like, you're speaking against love. And it's like, that's bad PR for Jesus. And, and it's like, and even that it's like, it's just been so interesting to like, get to know guys like Keith Giles and talk to him about it. And he's a guy that claims that like homosexuality wasn't even in the Bible until was it the 1970s? Oh, I saw that. 40s. 40s. I think. I think it's the 1940s. Right. And so I'm like, all right, you know what? Like as a straight person, this is a non-issue. Like I, I just, right. I don't like dudes in that way. Sure. And so I don't have to worry about it. And so why right. would I, why would I try to tell someone who to love? Right. And mm -hmm. it's like, and so I honestly, it's like, um, I never talk about this publicly, <laughs> but I don't really either. So yeah. I'm like, so I'm going to say, else. yeah, yeah. And so I'm just gonna, I'm going to put this out there and then I'll, I'll be done with this topic. Um, honestly, um, in one of um, Keith's uh, Facebook groups, he showed a picture of a man, um, you know, my age, maybe a little older, standing at a gay pride parade and he had a big sign and said, come to me for free hugs from a father. Oh, I and I was like, so much. I want to be that guy. That's, that's the thing. I just, yeah. I, I mean, I think, that's what Jesus would be doing. I know there Absolutely. are some other, some other gentlemen in the Bible who might be on the other side yelling other things. So there's yeah. biblical justification for either behavior. But I don't think that Jesus is going to be out there with those Westboro signs. You know, I think. No, I, really not. No. And I've personally, my, my opinion with any of these hot topic issues, and even some that aren't, is just, I, I think my handshake to everybody is just there's a God who loves you a lot. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you more if you want to know. I don't think I should ever walk up to somebody and be like, you, my gosh, you're like the worst sinner I've ever seen. Let me fix you. <laughs> no, like I don't want that. You know, I think that our handshake is just, we found something real and, and you should too, you know? And yeah, yeah well, I, that's I, it. And it's like I humble. the Holy Spirit can handle all that, uh, you know, conviction stuff uh, later on, maybe. Well, I'm at a point too, like with even the term the lost, I'm just uh -huh. like, I don't like that term. Cause I'm like, right. you know, you guys can talk about the lost all you want as if there's some other person, but I'm, I'm going to say this right now. I get a little lost myself sometimes, mm -hmm. you know? And it's like, I think we need so much more humility. And I think the thing that I see lacking, and honestly, I think this is happening on both sides, whether you're a fundamentalist or you're a woke dementalist. Um, mm -hmm. you are guilty of arrogance mm. and it's like the Lord opposes the proud. Yeah. How can I mean, you, it's be... all law keeping, you know, we're, we're keeping the laws of, you know, the woke dementalist, woke dementalism of, you know, yeah. like, no, we're keeping the laws of we have to be open in this yeah. or the fundamentalism of, you know, keeping the law. It's, it's all that on both sides it totally is and it's like um it's funny because i you know it's like if you want to offend a woke person 
use some of the wrong words. Mm -hmm. If you want, you know, wrong words to represent marginalized people. Now, I, I don't know how to be yeah. against them for that. But, <laughs> but that's, you know, you use the words, right? And it's kind of like when you're insistent on dead naming someone, that's yeah. going to trigger them. Sure. And rightly so. I mean, like I, my kids have friends who sure. would want to kill themselves if you dead made, named them. Sure. So it's like, let's, let's not do that. Right. Absolutely. Like um, just at least be nice to people, you know, and treat yeah. them with respect. It's something I've, you know, my kids are small. They're um, yeah. six and a half and about to be nine. The half mm -hmm. and about to be are very important. Yeah. Um, and just trying to explain in smaller terms and, you know, just kind of being like, okay, you know, your, your dad's name is Andrew. He doesn't like to be called Andy. So I don't mm -hmm. call him that. I mean, that's, yeah. that's minuscule, yeah. but it was enough that, um, cause the, they're homeschooled right now, which is a whole thing, yeah. but their curriculum is very conservative. And I've had yeah. to, you know, just be like, can you guys pause that? They're calling these people something they don't want to be called mm -hmm. and it's wrong. Like it's, yeah. it's in, not factual in the first place and it's insulting and disrespectful for these reasons. And not trying to be like, oh, we're so hypersensitive, we're so aware, but just, I don't call you something you don't want to be called, you know? So like, what, at the very, you know, they, thankful, you know, uh, Thanksgiving comes around and they're talking about the Indians and I'm like, pause, <laughs> we're going to call them Native Americans, this is why. Yeah. And just, at the very least, be correct, but also just be nice. They don't want to be called that because they aren't, so we're going to at least call them by the right thing. I just respect people. Yeah, no, it's funny. I, I think this is a difference too in our countries because I think you guys have been using Indian way longer than we did. I think um, so, right? Yeah, because I mean, like, I think it was probably the 80s that were like, yeah, we don't use that. Okay. And we went from that to natives to, then we called them First Nations people. First Nation. mm -hmm. And now I think the term is indigenous. That's indigenous. what we use now, yeah. right? And so- and it's interesting because you still have like kind of the old people who are like, well, I have a friend that likes to be called Indian. And it's like, all right, well. Okay. Well, I guess. I wouldn't apply that to everyone. I mean, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, I know I know white people that get the N word pass, but I, I don't think that means you can use that like no. ever. Right. I just, it's too bad that we have these words. Right. And. Yeah. But it's funny because it's like the same thing that offends, you know, language can offend the fundamentalists too. And so I think, you know, like you make sure you don't swear around grandma, mm -hmm. you know? And so like, could we apply the same thing, you know, if you're a conservative in a woke circle, right? Like, it's like, I just think, you know, being all things to all men, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, and women, but <laughs> amen, <laughs> a woman. No. Oh my gosh. <laughs> It cracked me up. I thought it was funny. Apparently, I thought it was. You know, I I thought it was hilarious too. But I also knew, oh great, now people are going to use this against yes woke I people. Like, and I'm oh, like, I'm can so you so ready for the conversation of like, oh, and did you hear about this? And I'm like, yeah. let me go figure it out so I know what's actually happening. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah, I just you know I my uh, my view on political correctness. I th I guess. I guess I must have been way more of a fundamentalist. It's just hard to remember that now. Than you realized. <laughs> yeah, because I, I remember, you know, being like, oh, yeah, the political correctness is garbage and all this stuff. And I was listening to What You Missed in History class. Oh, okay. Um, and um, these ladies were, like, talking. They were, um, they had, like, a, a viewer, um, I guess a viewer commented and, you know, said, something and they said along the line you know something along the lines of like um oh i hate to go all politically correct on you and mm -hmm. the lady basically as she was reading the comments she stopped and she's like okay i'm just gonna stop right now and i'm gonna right. say it's never wrong to be politically correct because all you're doing is being sensitive to the fact that there's someone else who may be hurt by the language you're using right and i was like and it just like it just clicked in me i was like there's no shame in being politically correct. Right. And I, it's, it's so the, weird to me now. The most basic, it's considerate. Right. Yeah. And I was like, I think being politically correct is a Christian virtue. And I posted that on Facebook and a bunch of people got mad at me. But. <laughs> you do like to make Christians mad. 
Yeah, yeah, it's fun. I I don't see the point in offending, you know, the lost. <laughs> the lost. The world, the I want secular those, world. I want those sheep to come back to the fold. <laughs> So you you're nice to them. That's good. <laughs> yeah, I'm. Yeah, I use. I am. Yeah, I don't know. There's probably some people on Parlay that actually. I'm really polite on Parlay. I, I there's like somebody called me like yeah. Some they use some like very like uh, ableist language against me. Oh. Yeah, and I was just like I'm just gonna ignore that and I'm just gonna throw some big words at them. Just. <laughs> Just yeah. take up their time while they oh, listen. What's the best? Like, <laughs> just get as technical as you can, right? So I just start yeah. using some like technical jargon from work and stuff. And they're like, oh, oh, okay. No, it seems like you have done your research. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that with me. I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I don't know. It's Green kind of fun. Parlor, I like the best. I, I'm, I'm not on there, but any of the screenshots of, I don't know what, what people are saying it cracks me up yeah and i'm hoping that it's mostly trolls but i know in my heart it's not yeah it's it's a terrible place it really it's is terrible. but it's kind of fun to like i don't know kind of mess with them a little bit because it's uh, it's yeah. funny because they think they're being hurtful to me and i'm just like i'm not like this isn't this isn't hurting I, me. You're there for fun. And I guarantee every now and then there's people that are like, well, calm down. You're so invested. You're so, you know, <laughs> like, this is such a big deal for you. You know, don't you? And I'm like, I'm, I'm actually just chill right now. I'm, I, I have no problem. I'm not upset at all. You know, you can keep saying that, but I'm not I'm trying true. to think if I've ever actually gained any perspective from there. But <laughs> like, um, it's interesting how I think, you know, what really shocked me was when you first heard about Trump and voter fraud and there were three outlets in Canada where I saw the headline and it's like, Trump says there's voter fraud, even though there's no evidence. It said mm -hmm. in the headline on all three news outlets. And I'm like, okay, that seems, that seems a little bit left biased. You know, like, it's like, yeah. you won't even let me read the article without telling me but there's no evidence, right? That's, I was the like, teaser. That's the whole story. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, you guys, yeah, like, it's kind of silly. It's like, you don't want to give them any ammo whatsoever. So I'm like, I, I get it. Mm -hmm. Like, I kind of understand why people think the media is biased against them. Sure. But at the same time, I don't really understand why they think that finding an independent resource or an independent news source is then going to be safe. Like, I just, I'm like, okay, like you guys, like, right. I mean, the thing that really gets me is when people are just like, look at me and say masks don't work. I mean, I've been told point blank by people right. I know masks don't work. And it's like, you know what I do for a living, right? <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> and so I don't know. It's it's weird though too because it's like I'm I I've kind of gotten to a point too, um, and I guess was part of my kind of my growing up and growing comfortable with myself is like I don't want to do self promotion. I don't want to go around telling people this is the kind of person I am, right? Mm -hmm. And so I like we even did an ADD Masterminds episode that I titled "I Know Things About Things." Because that's something I feel like I keep hearing from the boomers all the time. It's like you start getting into an argument and you're like, well, no, no, it doesn't work that way. And they're like, I know things about things, right? And it's just like, okay, yeah, I don't want to be that ever. Right, right. And so like even when I'm getting into like kind of that mass debate, I'm not going to say, well, I'm an industrial hygienist. You know, it's like I don't need to wave that. I'm just right. going to, you know, I'm just going to like maybe talk above their heads a little bit. Right. And see what happens. <laughs> oh my gosh, masks don't work. It's still all a hoax. I mean, I spoke to somebody. It was still during the beginning of law. It was probably over like late spring, summer, who literally said, uh, "You know, I'm not at all concerned about this made-up Chinese virus." And I was like, "You, you think there's literally nothing right now?" She was like, "Yeah, no, but it doesn't exist." It's like, okay, so, you know, my, my best friends who are nurses and doctors are lying to me about the people they're seeing, the people they're treating, the vents. And she was like, yeah, your friends are lying. It's like, well, <laughs> can, I, 
I think we're done. It's been a time. <laughs> like you've got, a, you've given me now a story to tell. But yeah, I can see. Be, you know, I, I'm a little susceptible to conspiracy theories. I it's a slippery slope for me. Got to watch that. But um, you know, so I can see people get a little. You know, no, the numbers are inflated, and this is blown up. Like I can see how. I don't necessarily agree. I can see how you get there. But to totally go like this thing doesn't even exist, I don't understand it. I hopefully, I hopefully they believe it now. One of, one of my favorite things I saw was like where they were talking about like, uh, it's like, uh, oh, I'm trying to think. It was like uh, something about the sun. It's like you have a conspiracy theory. If someone has a conspiracy theory, you need to one up them. Oh, oh. that's what it is. So it's like uh, man did not land on the moon. And you look at them and you say, you believe there's a moon? <laughs> that one's so good so good uh, oh, so yeah. I'm like I, I just want to do like a next level crazy with these people it'd be kind of fun um well that's kind of like I, I guess that's why I said you know like I'm like Bill Gates and I said Bill Gates is my favorite reptilian listen to his message or whatever I said on Facebook it was like something to that effect anyway every now like, and then those reptilian overlord comments pop up in my feed you know, I know like, isn't that crazy there he is. <laughs> it's so funny because it was just like I, you know, when I heard that Sarah Siani, Siarni, Sarah Sai. Yeah. yeah. And I, I said it right when I had her on my podcast. I asked her how to say it right before I said it. Yeah. Um, but she like she said that every time a, a relevant you know article comes up, she posts the same thing. And it was like something about being a millennial and spending too much money at Starbucks to afford a yeah. house. I'm just like, I love that so much. Like, that is the best. And I'm like, I need to come up with one. And that's that's what I came up with. I didn't think I was going to do that every time, but now I did. And then when Jerry Falwell came up, I'm like, I can't do this. I can't do this. <laughs> and I'm like, he's my least favorite reptilian overlord. So That little flip. That was little a game flip. changer. It was great. Little flip. Throw, I'm throw kind of disappointed that, like, uh, Justin Bieber's not actually going to become a pastor. I'm not disappointed at all, but that would have been for some fun. I, just think, I mean, I just think it was fun, a fun idea. I was like, it would have been fun to watch for sure. That would have been, yeah, no, that would have been interesting. But to go off on a tangent, those relevant comment sections are terrible. I they mean, are like, so terrible. I know. And nothing ever gets deleted. Uh, you know, I mm. love the magazine, love the podcast, you know, Cameron, if you're listening. Um, but I, the, I'm like, what? nothing ever leaves like there's crazy stuff out there that I'm like do you just just delete some people just block some you know (laughs) they're oh my gosh it's a cesspool yeah I was heavy heavy into relevant for the longest time and I think it got like I guess they kind of took that hiatus when like Cameron kind of had his thing with Andre Henry which yeah I really want to read Andre Henry's Book. I don't know if that'll actually shed some light on what happened there, but I'm like, and I, I would also, you know, I'm yeah. I'm really interested because he's he's got a lot of you know feelings and he's got his right to have them, and I'm just yeah. like I I'm so lost. I need to know exactly yeah. what went on. Yeah, but, um, and I mean, like, I, this is the thing too. Like, it's like um, Mark Driscoll in that situation where you right. kept hearing rumors that there was a big issue and all this right. stuff and. And it's so funny how that like Christians react to this kind of stuff because they're like, oh no, 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 we need to, we need to forgive this person and restore them. And it's like, I don't know if that's my job. Like, it's really not mm-hmm. my job to say. I don't think like, and I actually said this on the last ADD Masterminds episode. I was like, it's not my job to condemn or forgive people who did things that weren't to me. Fair. Yeah. You know, and it's like, yes, I need to defend the person that's being hurt. Right. And I think right. this is the same thing. You know, it's like me too. Right. Mm-hmm. You look at me too. And people are like, believe all women. And then you got like, people are like, no, women lie. And I'm like, okay, well, I believe in due process. Um, I don't believe in like disbelieving victims. Right. So what about this? How about we say that the victim is innocent until proven guilty and the perpetrator is innocent until proven right. guilty. Can we do that? Right. 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 But I mean, our- two things. One of them is, you know, that yeah, in in the Me Too stuff and sexual harassment, it, it's the pretty much the only time that the victim gets put on trial to be believable yeah. enough. Yeah. And yeah. I don't know if this is a time thing or gender lines because I can't come up with anybody else from like the '90s. But um, like I remember when 
like Sandy Patty, you know, had an affair or something mm-hmm. and she got mm-hmm. divorced and everything around was just so much about in, in the climate I was in at least was very like, can we even play her music anymore? Yes. Can we sing yes. her songs? Like she can't ever. And I remember being in a car with a very righteous, you know, friend of mine who was just like, no, like she's done, like she's fallen in this big way publicly. And I was like, well, so did like everyone in the Bible and yeah. we're all people at some point yeah. she has to be able to like, if she has, if there's been humility, if there's been repentance, like it's, it's not just done. She has to be able to go, you know what past happened and I'm sorry and whatever and move on. Same with like Amy Grant and stuff like that. And I don't know if that was just at the time we were way more like, nope, done. Or if it's like women fell and it was a bigger deal, but you know, the like, I don't know, man, it's the the cancel culture that everything is, it's a rough, rough time. But it's like, we were so concerned over infidelity, Mm -hmm. right? And so Bill Clinton, mad about his infidelity, Mm -hmm. right? But our culture has shifted now where we're like, hold on, that's not infidelity. Right. That is a guy in power. Kind of mm. like King David. Oh, yeah. Asking mm-hmm. Bathsheba to come to his room. Right. So you think Bathsheba had any choice in that? Right. right. Oh, and yeah, so yeah. Monica Lewinsky and Bill Clinton, it's like, no, he had power over her. Right. And so it's like we're defending the wrong, like we're fighting against the wrong people. And again, this is kind of a Jesus PR thing. What if, what if the church would have been there from the get go and kind of said, hey, you know what? I know they're two adults, but he had power over her. This is yeah. wrong. The guy's a predator. Yeah. I'm, I'm convinced yeah. Bill Clinton's a predator. I mean, I'm convinced Donald Trump's a predator too. <laughs> I, I think everybody's a predator. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, We're all kind of predator. No. <laughs> I don't, you know, that's crazy though. Like that's the thing on Twitter too. And it's like, I've encountered, you know, a few women on Twitter that are just like, yeah. I get guys in my DMs all the time, like creepy dudes. And I'm just like, this is so messed up. Like, like guys that claim to be Christians, you know, like Ooh, upstanding yeah. members of society, like the Ravi Zacharias kind of right. people. Right. And it's just like victimizing. Right. And it's like the church has not been on the forefront of that. They would rather deal with Amy Grant's divorce. Yeah. And it's like, why and it's just so easy for the church to get off track and it's like we should be protecting people from abusers i mean that should be our number one thing yet i feel like the number one thing is like well i don't want you guys to love those people Mm -hmm. um and i think like it's like um the gospel is offensive like this whole time you know we Every time, you know, we start talking about stuff where it's like, well, these guys have taken this too far. It's like, well, the gospel is offensive, Mm -hmm. right? And it's like, well, the gospel is not offensive because it hates the wrong people. Right. The gospel is offensive because it loves the wrong people. Mm. And so I, I feel like a lot of these people that are boasting that the gospel is offensive and like, you know, shut up. I'm just, you, you just let me say what I say. Yeah. I'm like, I think you're the person the gospel is offensive to. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I just always go back to, you know, it's Jesus's behavior. I'm interested in it's the way Jesus talked to people, mm-hmm. you know, that I want to know about, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it's, I, I made the mistake of, uh, considering on Twitter that Jesus may have been pro women. And it was, or I, I might have said feminist, but you know, and there was just, oh my gosh, he absolutely. And I'm like, well, I mean, if we we can talk about the woman at the well who nobody would go near, like this, te- that technically was quite the feminist act of the time yeah. of going and talking to her, and and uh, you know, he at very least supported them and kept them in, you know, in positions of honor, you know, right down to. Um, I read a book about um, Mary Magdalene last year. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's not a lot about her in the canon. There's a lot in um, the Apocrypha or whatever it's called, mm-hmm. but, and, and history um, of her. And the fact that 
I mean, it blew my mind that she like traveled with Jesus. I didn't realize this and that there were women that traveled with him and wives of apostles and everything. And I'm like, they bankrolled his ministry. Like they're oh, yes. financing his ministry. This yeah. has been like the revelation of the last, I don't know, like 18 months or something. Yeah. Like uh, not last Easter, it was probably Easter 2019. And it, it might've been relevant. Somebody was like, can we talk a minute? You know, like, the first person to see and recognize Jesus. Yes. Like the women were there at the women. Yeah. And for a little bit, like I pulled over and like cried a little bit. I was like, for a little bit, she was the only one who knew. And she yes. held that and took it to the to the boys, took it to the men yeah. and told them. But just for uh, whether she was five minutes out of town or like she ran for an hour for that little bit, she held it all. Yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, like that, <laughs> that dry that just blows my mind and every now and then like I try to put that stuff in my daughter's head and I'll be like and who was the first person to see Jesus recognize and she's like a woman (laughs) well a woman carried Jesus yes I mean so you know childbirth and it's like Joseph was like not the father (laughs) yeah it's like that's that's incredible too I I like the story too like if you talk about like Mary and Martha I think that we've been like historically the church has read it in such a way that it's like oh yeah okay don't be a don't be miss busy all the time maybe be miss busy sometimes right Mm -hmm. and it's like i heard an interpretation on that that was more of a feminist interpretation where it's like okay the fact that martha was doing what a woman's supposed to do mary was down there with the boys like she Mm -hmm. was hanging out with jesus which is what the boys did Right, so basically right, right. she was breaking the social convention there, which is a feminist thing to do. And I'm like, that's so cool. And you know what? I, it's funny. Cause like people are always like looking at that and they're talking about what masculinity should be and all this stuff. I'm going to say, you know, like as, as a man, I'm man enough to be able to acknowledge women and be right. okay with, you know, like to, to, yeah. to, to cheer you on. Right. And it's like, right. And I mean, I love having a daughter. I, when she was born, I was just like, oh my gosh, okay. I'm going to listen to some super chick. <laughs> <laughs> and then you'll it's be like, we have two boys in the house. And I'm like, okay, I got to uh, figure out what kind of girl stuff is cool, right? What do girls do? Yeah. Yeah, what do girls do? And you know what? Turns out she figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> She'll get there all on her own. You don't yeah. need to tell them to be a crazy horse girl or, you know like the costumes and the dresses and they'll find it all right so let's get to what you really want us to talk about today um yeah what do you think is under donald trump's hair oh my gosh i'm so scared to like find out someday i don't i mean did you see there were pictures at some point that it looked like he had like like micro stuff stuck in his head like he looked like he had chips behind his ear or something i have not and seen that i have not seen some that. Pictures. <laughs> no okay i'm gonna try to find them but they had like it looked like he had i don't know some kind of microchip stuff kind of up in his hair and i know that jimmy fallon messed it up one time and what i'm about to say will probably put me on like some kind of fbi radar i don't <laughs> want anything bad to happen to him i'm not I don't want any violence, but if someone like ran up to him with like some shears, like some battery powered clippers and just went like reverse (laughs) mohawk, my life would be made. Cause (laughs) what are you going to do? You're going to get mad, but you can't cover that up. It's just right. Oh, that would just, I can't believe that hasn't (laughs) happened. That's what I would do if I was insane and had nothing to lose. I'm not going to hurt anybody, but I just want to be like, all right, now you have to have real hair, you know? You have no choice. You know, one of my favorite conspiracy theories is the whole, like, that's not really Melania. I love that one. (laughs) And I I totally get into the pictures and I'm like, look at the nose. Look at this. This was her on Monday. This was her on Friday. Different person. I I love them all. Can I, I have to confess, I watched a bunch of QAnon stuff a couple of years ago, Uh like probably around election time. And I was like, oh maybe the royal family is really bad maybe this maybe like the whole Prince Andrew for sure like I think that we're proving that now like I'm like absolutely said there is something but 
this whole idea, I think what's so hilarious about QAnon, and I, I think I summed it on Twitter one time quite aptly. I'm like, everybody's yeah. a predator except for Donald Trump. It's so true, though. <laughs> and they're, they're, yes, he's the only one we can Not trust. him. Not he him. has a plan. You know, there's a lot of like, just trust the process. You know, they think he sends the messages sometimes. Like, did you see when he tapped on the thing? He's going to be fine. And I'm like, I, what kind of creative mind gets that? I, I just don't know. This, but, this blows my mind because like, it was like, I don't know if you remember R William Hung. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, okay. So I felt like Trump was like the William Hung of politics. I'm like, is anyone going to let him in on the joke that, that like we don't really like him? But then it turned out that like a whole lot of people turned. Like I was, it was so yeah. incredible because like before the primaries were over, I had a family that were like, yeah, this guy's terrible. Like he should not, he should not win the primary. And then a week later he won the primary and they're like, he's God's chosen. And I'm like, what, what happened? Like a whole bunch of people flipped. And it was so incredible. And so, I mean, to this day, they're still insistent. There's voter fraud and all this right. stuff. And I'm just like, okay, well, you know what? I I don't know. Like, I, I'll be curious to see how that goes. Let's, let's like, see what happens. Day, moving out day. But I'm like, you That's guys have the longest election process of all time. Yeah. And it's like the fact that they're debating this. I'm like, I feel like you guys are like in... It's like uh, a person in an abusive relationship with a narcissist. And it's like, okay, all right. Yeah, he said he's leaving the house on Friday. And it's mm -hmm. like, okay, okay. So you finally got him out of your house. That's awesome. You know what? He's staying. <laughs> and it's just like, no, 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 no. We said Friday, right? <laughs> and so it's like, and I'm just kind of watching this. And it's just so hard for me to not... <sighs> pick a side on this because mm. I'm just like I feel like there's been so much damage done and I feel like and this was the conversation I had on Twitter I'm like there's 50 yeah. percent of your country that wants nothing to do with Christianity because of this mm. and they're like you're believing the fake news media you know it's not 50 percent yeah. I'm like okay well what percentage is it like whatever it is you're saying I don't care about these people because right. I mean, you're, you're cool yeah. with the Sean Fucht, the, um, that's brave. Frank you went right Green. for his name. I just went for it. You yeah. went for if, it. If you pronounce it with confidence, right. <laughs> People will believe you're saying it right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, what was the other guy? Whatever the other guy was. That guy. Uh, Locke, Greg yeah. Locke. Right. And it's like, so there's just this whole, I, I, feel like and I think people are telling me on the conservative side that I'm wrong about this but I think I'm right anyways I feel like Trump really created something um and it was almost like a brainwashing but there's like just this spiritual thing that's happened where it's like I don't care I don't care about all of those people yeah. liberals are not human beings and it's just like okay like it, this is this is a big problem oh so, so weird I, I mean, I've voted in several presidential elections. Mm -hmm. I don't remember it being this crazy. Yeah. I don't remember it being this polarizing. Honestly, yeah. you know, I'm a very privileged person that no matter yeah. who's been president, there's not been a lot that's affected me directly that I'm like, yeah. it was better for me under that person. But, and you know, you, you want to vote for your platform. You want to vote for your, like, I get vote for who you want to vote for. That's fine. But when, when people started getting very like, he is God's man. He's the yeah. one. It freaks me out, you know, and, yes, and yeah. the amount of stuff that has come out and they'll just go, no, it, it's not, or it doesn't like yeah. the tape that just came out. And, and the focus is how dare <laughs> someone record him. And I'm like, Weird. <laughs> and it was so funny to me like, is like anybody on the left that's like we finally got him i'm like no you don't <laughs> no <laughs> nothing has worked you so never got him <laughs> it's never gonna stick whatever anytime it's like hey here's a new bombshell i'm like eh, nothing's gonna happen <laughs> we got a couple more days we'll see how it goes but i know well yeah and so i'm like okay so the 20th there should be a transfer of power I have no idea how that's going to go, but I'm doing my best to be your Canadian support animal. 
I appreciate that. <laughs> I need it. I need it. He, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know when they start the moving out process. Like a little bit of me yeah, feels yeah. like he'll be some kind of child who wants to go like, eh, I'm not going to come. Like if he didn't show up to the inauguration, that would be so on brand, on brand, yeah, but yeah. just would blow my Man, mind. Would I, I really hope though, and I, I hope this in Canada too, it's like, just give us a good alternative. You know, yeah. if you're going to support yeah. like conservatism, let's get a good candidate out there. That's not a parody of himself, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's like, let's not make Christians into parodies of themselves. Right. And, and so, and just being able to sometimes somehow work out how to build these bridges. Cause like I, about a week ago, I totally lost my belief i can build bridges and i built a whole persona around bridge building you did. and i'm like ah right and so um but i think i think really it's not words that are going to fix this i think it's example that's going to fix this it has to be i mean nobody is getting convinced everybody believes what they believe nobody is getting convinced of anything else yeah. um and it's either just able to dismiss information that you don't agree with. Yeah, I think that example is pretty much all we've got at this point. Because just yeah. explaining and explaining turns into a fight. And um, I personally am tired of trying to constantly prove that I'm right. And that almost yeah. sounds like a joke, but it's true. Like, I just have this, you know, like, no, I've put thought into this and I can't see how anybody else could have put thought into it and come to a different conclusion. Yeah. And I'm trying more and more to just, okay, you got there some other way. That's fine. Um, yeah, just let people be people. That's fine. I don't have to be in charge of them because I don't want them in charge of me. Well, I think that um, the more I talk to like conservatives, the more I realize that they believe truth is everything. Mm. And this whole like facts don't care about your feelings, Ben Shapiro thing. And I'm kind of like, that's so well, stupid. That guy. <laughs> like that's that's silly because it's like we're human beings, you know, right. we're we are intellect and emotions. And you know, when I consider like Susan David saying, you know, facts or sorry, <laughs> facts don't care about feelings. <laughs> she <would never. laughs> Susan Shapiro, no, um, <laughs> Susan David saying emotions are data, not directives. It's like, I feel like on the conservative side, people need to recognize that the emotions are part of the data set. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, you can't just divorce yourself from emotions. Right. Um, it's actually part of how we think rationally. It's how we learn right. to prioritize. It's why to sort that data, you know? Yeah. And that's why, that that's sense. why, you know, they are broken hearted when they know that there is a very high number of abortions that happen every year. Right. That's the emotions. That's not just facts. Right. 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 And so it's, um, and I think on the left, it's like, okay, but emotions are not directives. And so when mm -hmm. we talk about like empathy and it's like, empathy is great, but the problem with empathy is that it acts like a spotlight. And it's like, um, you can only be empathetic very specifically. And so to develop mm -hmm. a policy based on empathy, it's like, okay, who's the one person I care about, <laughs> right? right. And, that's, right, right. and that's where, you know, you need to look more at statistics and you need to look more, sure. you know, it's like more of a, um, I guess, looking at the trees rather than, or looking at the forest rather than the trees, right? Right, right, right. And so I, I, I think there's a lot to learn from each other. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I get why, but I don't necessarily get how abortion became like the one thing that Christians are gonna focus on, you know, specifically with politics. And then homosexuality became their big pinnacle sin. Like, I don't know, when I was growing up, it was, you know, like pride. Like, I don't know if it was just mm -hmm. the environment I was in, mm -hmm. but it was like the worst thing you could be is any kind of prideful. That was going to take everybody down with you. I remember hearing about abortion, but not a lot. But it's also just, 
the amount of people to be, we don't have to go down this wormhole, but the amount of people that I've talked to that don't, don't know what they're talking about. And I don't want to be like women necessarily have a monopoly on it, though we're the ones who do carry babies. You know, I think guys can have input. I'm not going to totally cut y'all out of the the conversation, but I'm like, I, I've carried babies that I love and mm. wanted, and it was still terrible, you know, yeah. and I can't imagine making somebody do that. And yeah, the numbers um, I'm realizing are... <laughs> I went back and forth for hours on this. I, I wasted so much time on Twitter because it was like the numbers, you know, specifically, I believe it's, you know, everywhere, but specifically America, legally and medically, um, if there's a ectopic pregnancy and they have to remove that, or if there's a miscarriage that's incomplete and they have to remove, you know, unfortunately the baby from the mom, those are in the numbers. Like the mm. So even the numbers that we're getting are inflated, but if you're going like, Hey, I'm pro-life. So we need a full ban. I'm like, you don't necessarily know what you're talking about. Cause we're now talking about a lot of dead moms, you know? Mm-hmm. So as much as I definitely go, no, I, I want the babies to be born. There's, it's not nearly as black and white as everybody wants to make it. And I just kept getting told, you know, like, no, those aren't abortions. Those are something else. And I'm like, I'm, I'm telling you, it's medically coded this way. It's mm. legally considered this. So we can't just throw everything else out. Right. But then we, you know, it, it almost seems impossible to tear it down and turn it into, all right, legally and medically, these are something else. And we'll call that something else, you know, and just, it was back, it drove me crazy. And finally I was like, I, I have to be done. I can't do this anymore. But you know, that, that gave me a lot of just, oh, I have friends who technically have had them then. If, you know, I had a friend with a um, struggle to have children, wanted kids so badly and had an ectopic pregnancy mm. and ended up in like a medical, like a lot went down and she nearly lost her life from infections and stuff like that. That's, that's what is in the numbers as well. And it's, it's a stickier stickier issue than I ever ever realized you know it is we're talking about and I have no idea how to fix it because it's so so complicated yeah and here in Canada we don't even have an abortion law oh yeah like I I guess they just decriminalized it and it just happens and so like it's not even on the table politically but like my understanding from Sky Jatani is Mm -hmm. that like originally what happened is um, there were segregationist schools that were Christian that okay. basically got um, some input from Republicans that were running for Congress or whatever. <laughs> and uh, I'm telling for this something. very authoritatively. Um, Again, I was homeschooled. Tell me whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> and so anyways, yeah. So these, so these guys are like, we want to we want to get Christians on our side and it's like well they want segregated schools even though they're like getting rid of segregation whatever that is um so it's like integrated schools and um so these guys are like well we're going to stand up for your right to a Christian education right mm-hmm. and so they did that and they ended up winning big in the south but then it was like oh crap how do we win in the north because they wanted to get like kind of this whole religious right going. And they were like, oh, Catholics are like heavy against abortion. And so they're like, well, mm. the North isn't racist like the South. And so the way that we can get them then is we will get them into this whole abortion thing and be against abortion. Up until that, evangelicals didn't care. Like it was a yeah. non issue. But it then became a religious issue and became a political issue. And ever since then, it's been Mm. like the symbol of the right is like we're against abortion. And that was created by somebody like running for office, you know, that and if you told them that, you know, you only care because somebody kind of like makes you care, you know, and yeah, ridiculous. And they decided to say this to get your vote. They wanted your vote and they figured out this was the way. Well, and this is the crazy thing is like, okay, so people are so divided. Like we're at the point now where it's kind of like looking at like, okay, well, what happens if you got a kid that's a botched abortion and Mm -hmm. they end up being born and the Democrats are like, put that child out of his misery, right? 
And it's like, oh my, like how, like, why can we back up? Like, can we just back up and let's like, okay, how are we getting unwanted pregnancies? Because I'm pretty sure all of us could agree. Okay. Like let's um, reduce rapes, <laughs> you know, let's, um, let's, I don't want, yes. let's have a society with less toxic masculinity where these men are trying to use women. Right. Like, and it's like, could we do that? Like, I think we could all agree to do that. And so I, I feel like with a lot of these issues, it's like, can we back up and find that point where we actually agree? Mm. And that's not nearly, you know, that doesn't necessarily sell, yeah. right? It's like, this yeah. is what like media is so driven. And it's funny because people just want to, you know, on the right, just want to say mainstream media is driven by this kind of polarization. It's like, no, all, all media, all media that's big mm-hmm. is, is like that. And I think that's why it's so interesting about what Rogan's doing. And he gets in trouble a lot, but it's like he will have, you know, a liberal. He will have a conservative on his podcast. And that's, yeah. I think that that's something that's so important. And we need more of that because we do have common ground. And mm-hmm. I think behind, you know, whoever your enemy is, there's an enemy behind your enemy. And sure. he seeks sure. to destroy. He just seeks to divide. And it's like the reality is that we as humans, for the most part, we want the same things. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's that's something that has, I, I feel bad that it's taken me this long into adulthood to go, oh, okay, like left and right, whatever. We all want the same thing in the end. And I think uh-huh. most of what we're fighting about is how we get there. And that's totally. really stupid. So if it's, it is. you know, if people could go like, okay, this is, this is the end game that we want, right? Now let's agree on the way to get to it. Like nobody, nobody actually hates the poor. Nobody actually, no. this, nobody really, but no. they're the methods to get to everybody sustainably existing safely. You know, that's the, uh, that's, it's the method. It's the journey. It's the way that they get there. That's been the big fight. That's the big learning for me in talking to Jeff Dornick. Um, Cause he has like a whole podcast network of like crazy Republican people, the freedom first network. I actually went on the freedom faction and uh, oh, yeah. I already knew like going into it. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to find a point of agreement with these guys. And they were like, they were prepared to have this liberal on, which I'm like, I don't know yeah. why they labeled me a liberal. I don't label myself. I'm uncaged guys. Like, come on. Don't you get it? Yeah. But, um, but anyways, it was kind of funny because I, I knew pretty early on in the discussion that I was like, you know what? I can say that we already agree that we don't like big business. Mm. And that's the crazy thing is that like everybody knows Democrats don't like big business, but a lot of these free market people, they don't like big business either. Mm. You know, they want small businesses to flourish. And it's like, my gosh, like that. We can all agree to help out small businesses. I work for a small business again now and I love it. And it's like, it's like, and so, I mean, I think we can say the same thing about government too. Like it doesn't make sense to give like one overarching government so much power and they don't really understand these small communities. Right. And so there's just a lot there that I'm like, there's a lot of conversation, you know, to be had in those areas. Um, but it's like, it requires us actually being able to back up. And so, mm-hmm. and it's, it's being adults and it's part of this whole growing up thing, which is the theme of this podcast today. Ah, yes. Growing up with me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah. any last words? Mm. Oh gosh. I was, I was asking my husband, I was like, okay, so the mic turns off and I walk out and I go, Oh crud. What did I not <laughs> say? That, you know, like what is the thing that's going to drive me crazy? And, um, gosh, I don't know. I mean, I feel like we've run such a, such a good gamut of just like openness, love God, love people. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, my, my pet thing is always just like birth and, uh, and mental health. And, you know, we, we touched on both of those, but I'm excited to be here. This has been fun. It's my first time and it gets to be named after me, which is cool. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's fun. 
Um, so how should listeners get in contact with you if they'd like to get in contact with you? Oh, gosh. Um, well, if you have something nice to say. No, um, I don't know. <laughs> um, on Twitter right now, I, I never remember what my handle is. I think it's I drink anarchy. And it I is. don't know why it's that. I can't, <laughs> can't even remember. Okay. If you want to talk to me, I'm around. But uh, awesome. I don't know. Tweet me. All right. I will put a link to your Twitter page in the show notes. Thank right. you for coming on. Thank you. Sounds good. Air smudge. And now a random moment from ADD Masterminds. Truth. <laughs> Truth is part of love. Right. If you actually pursue love, there will be truth in it. Sure. You know, if I truly love my child, I'm not going to let him, you know, become a, you know, murderer, drug addict, you know, awful, awful, whatever. I'm not going to be okay with that. You know, I love my child. I want find ADD Masterminds on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, 